right, 270 down at the cross where my Saviour died. Verses 1 and 2 again, and let's have a, let's have a good sing. Now you can do far better than that, let's, let's raise the roof. Two seven seven on the golden streets of heaven, all men hope to walk some day. Verses one and three of this one. Verses one and three. In 310, redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed how, uh, verses 1 and 2 please.
320, I am redeemed, oh praise the Lord. We'll sing one and two of this one. Now you're singing well. Yes, really, let them know outside you're singing. Okay, let's hear it. Three hundred and twenty. The machine has blew up. So three hundred and three hundred and twenty in your hymn book, and we'll sing verses two. I am redeemed. If you're not sure what page it is, it's three hundred and six in the hymn book. Three zero six, and it's hymn three two zero. Okay. This one is hymn number 157237 in your hymn book, page 237151, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. Let's sing this one. And we'll, when you get to the chorus, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll put my hand up and you can hold it a wee bit, okay? I'll let you, I'll let you hear it whenever you, you go, right? So hymn one and, uh, 151, one and two. I don't know if you've got any singing voice left after that. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. We do appreciate uh, your help, uh, certainly getting them roused up. I could actually hear you, by the way, the windows are open. I could hear you over in the prayer meeting, and that was an indication that we need to get over to the church. We could hear you singing. And I would suggest to you, if folks are out walking as well, they maybe even be able to hear your good singing outside. Maybe we'll someday relay 
the service to the carriageway and folks that are going by and walking, running on their bicycles. And who knows, those that have their car window open, they might just get a little seed of truth. Uh, that's a great hymn, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. You know, there was, in, when I was at school, a little roll book, and the roll was called, it was actually called, and I have to say this to my shame. I say shame, I'm not all that ashamed. I never really liked school. But the role was called and I wasn't there. And I even learned early in life how to copy my father's signature. And I mean perfectly. If you had his and mine, mine was actually better than his. <laughs> but it was a beautiful copy. And I used to write sick notes and sign them by my dad and then send them in. But the teachers knew I was one of the healthiest young people in Lurgan Boys Junior High School. I played on every single team at the school except the girls' hockey team. They wouldn't let me play with a girls' hockey team, but on everything. And they said, this is one of the sickest persons in this school. But you know, when the role is called up yonder in heaven, I want to tell you, I'll be there. I wonder, will you? There's another hymn we're going to sing. I didn't realize Alan was going to sing that hymn, uh, but it ties in exactly with the hymn you've just been singing. It's 340 in our hymn book, 340 in our hymn book, and uh, it tells in the chorus of a day when you're counted in. That's not only the day whenever you were saved. There's no doubt that the hymn writer uh, thought about that time when he was counted in. Uh, but uh, they have here uh, the authors of our hymn book, Romans 4 and 5, and that is right you're, when you receive Christ, you get his righteousness and you're counted righteous in his sight. And so they put the reference, but I'm not trying to be smart, but I think the reference should be Psalm 23 and verse 4, because I believe that's what the hymn writer's meaning here, uh, because he speaks about the rod and the staff. And here's the remarkable thing. You see at night, the shepherd in the east... He had the rod. And what he did was, he was the door to the, to the pen, to the sheepfold. He was the actual door. He had all the sticks and stones around it, but he was the actual door. He lay across the threshold to protect the sheep. But every single night, he had the rod in his hand. And then he brought the sheep into the, the sheepfold, and he touched everyone with a rod, and he counted them. And in the parable, he had a hundred and there was one missing. There was one missing. There was one that wasn't counted in. And that's a reference to glory, to heaven. When the good shepherd Christ with the rod of salvation counts his sheep, counts one here, one young person over there, another senior person here, a little boy there and a little girl there, and he touches them with a rod and he counts them in. It's a wonderful thing to be counted in and to know that whenever the Lord returns or death comes you are counted in and when the roll is called up yonder you'll be there you'll be counted in so I want you to sing this hymn in light of what we've just said 340 we'll sing all of the hymn we'll change our position and we'll stand as we worship the Lord could I say just before we sing that you're very welcome we want to warmly welcome every single person who has joined with us and uh, we want you to feel at home here and I'm sure you've got a handshake at the door there'll be folks maybe sitting beside you will welcome you but we want to give you an official welcome and we want you to know that you are very warmly welcome to this house tonight we're glad to see you whether you're a stranger or visitor or regular worshipper we're just glad to see you and we want to thank you for joining with us and also for those that are listening online and the live stream we again warmly welcome you to our service may God richly bless you and your family at this time well that's enough said we get down to the singing and worship of the Lord 340 <laughs> Let's all stand as we sing.
see, you can't beat the hymn book. You may be seated, by the way. You cannot beat the hymn book. There was a scurry, and I mean that, and a flutter. I could hear it. I actually heard it. And the volume went away down, away, way down. Technology has failed. Is that the end of it, man? So it has blown up then. Okay. Uh, there's been some power surges today with the thunder and lightning. Our own home was the same, and uh, different things uh, did not work. We're not talking about the TV, by the way. <laughs> but uh, things didn't work, and plugs all seemed to have uh, not working. We were able to get trip switches sorted. Uh, but there's little power surges are coming. Is that what's happening there, man? It's just human error. Okay. So there's only four of them there. Like, that's all. You know what I mean? They've only, they've only one job to do. Put words on the screen. Come on. All right. I'm doing everything. But they have only one job. But anyway, it's always the way. But let's just unite our hearts in prayer. Loving Father, with thanksgiving and praise and adoration, we enter into thy holy presence. We thank thee for our blessed Savior. We thank thee for the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We thank thee, Lord, for uh, so great salvation purchased at highest cost. We thank thee for that day whenever we realized that we had wandered far away in the land of mighty foes and our soul had felt the bitterness of our sin. And Lord, we were marching with the host that the truth of God opposed, and among the saved we were not counted in. But there came a time and a point and a very specific definitive moment in our experience, whenever our eyes were opened to see our sin, whenever we looked by faith to Christ and by faith received him into our heart and life as our own, our personal Saviour. And we thank thee, O God, for salvation full and salvation free. We thank thee, Lord, for the love of God toward us, the grace of God sufficient, and we rejoice that our sins are forgiven. We have peace with God. It is well with our soul. And we lift our hearts in thanksgiving and praise for Calvary. Calvary covers it all. We thank thee for the cross upon which the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died for our sins. We know, O oh God, that we're not good enough for heaven. We know that there's nothing we can do and nothing we are and nothing the church can do or institution or organization, but Christ finished the work. We thank thee for that one great offering of the body and blood of Christ for our salvation. And there's nothing else in this entire created universe that, Father, you will accept on our behalf that we might be saved but the finished work and the precious shed blood of Christ. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other door by which we enter in. We realize, Lord, there is no salvation outside of Christ. We know, O oh God, no matter how good we try to be, we are sinners by birth, sinners by practice. We remain sinners lost and undone. Except, Lord, you come in grace and mercy and save us and convert us and that we experience the new birth and that we're born of the Spirit and washed in the blood. And there are many, O oh God, gathered here tonight, listening online and right across our entire province, and they know this truth through and through. And yet, Lord, there seems to be something that holds them back, something, O oh God, that they're unwilling to give up, something they're unwilling to accept. And we pray, Lord, thou wouldst come by thy spirit tonight and break down the stony heart of resistance. Grant, Lord, you will turn souls to the Saviour, that you'll come on a rescue mission, just as you did in the tent mission. You came by and you saved individuals. There are people present in this house tonight, others listening online, and they were saved by the grace of God, and others worshipping in other places, and they were washed in the blood. They were converted during the tent mission, and we bless thee for that. We're thankful, but here we are again, and Lord, Lord, there are still those who are out of Christ without a Savior, and we pray for them. We pray that this night they might come to know Christ, whom to know is life eternal. Lord, hear our prayer. Work by thy Holy Spirit. Save the lost, we beseech thee. Pour out of thy Spirit now, not only here in Cumber, but across our province and across, even Lord, those outside our own denomination that are faithful to the blood and to the book. Lay liberally to the charge of every ambassador of the cross. Lord, 
grant that thy saving grace and power will descend and fall afresh upon us, that you'll bring precious souls under conviction, give them no rest and no peace until they come as a sinner to the Lord and they're saved by sovereign grace and they're sure that they are going to heaven and that their sins are forgiven. They have peace with God and they have eternal life and Lord, that they would have the assurance that they'll never perish in hell, that they will be saved from sin, death and eternal hell. Lord, hear our cry. We know that hell burns as we speak. We know that countless, Lord, human beings will be cast into a lost eternity in hell. And we cry to thee, O God, whenever we consider that it is forever, forever, forever. And there, is, there are no exits from hell. We cry to thee, Lord, that thou wouldst come and rescue precious souls from the very mouth of the brink of the pit of hell. Lord, make this house and this meeting to be a preaching station one inch from the pit of the flames of hell that will warn sinners of the danger that awaits them at death or the coming of the Lord, that they may repent of their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of their soul. This is thy work, O God, and we acknowledge it. And we pray, Lord, you'll use the human instrument tonight even to bring the even conviction for sin. Remember uh, those who take part. We pray for our brother Stephen. We thank thee for the gifts and talents you've given to him, his willingness to serve the Lord over these many years. We thank thee for blessing and encouraging him. And we pray that as he comes tonight again, that thy servant would know that help he has known before, and he will have unusual liberty and freedom in singing, that he'll sing about his Savior. And we pray, Lord, it'll resonate with our hearts, and it'll bless our souls, and be used of God. And remember our brother Drew as he comes to share with us a personal word of testimony. We thank thee, O God, for saving thy servant, and we pray you'll use him tonight for thine eternal glory. So be with us now, and Father, in answer to prayer, be pleased to glorify thy Son, and the people of God said, Amen. And we are delighted to have our brother Stephen Anderson back with us again here in Cumber. We're going to ask him to come now, and he's going to bring his two messages in song. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be along here tonight. Um, I just pray that the Lord would bless these few pieces to your hearts, and I just ask if you'd listen to the words, they're powerful words, they're life-changing words, and I just pray that the Lord would bless them to you. covers 
it all. How blessed the thought that my soul by him bought shall be his in the glory on high, where with gladness and song I'll be one of the throng and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers it all. My past with its sin and stain, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there. And Calvary covers it Someday 
before a crumb and exchange it someday for a crumb. Well, we'd like to thank our brother Stephen very much indeed for ministering to us in song. I love those two pieces. I was very tempted just to get alongside him and join with him, but it would have ruined the whole night, that's for sure. I was trying to sing, but then I realized I need to keep my voice down because uh, a few notes were missing. Uh, but tremendous, tremendous pieces. He brought us to Calvary. Calvary covers it all. Brought us again to the cross. Uh, that's holy ground. We're on holy ground when we get to the cross. That's the place where God the Father punished God the Son through the eternal spirit for our sins. It's where Christ paid the price to save your soul and mine. That's where he offered one great sacrifice for sin forever to turn away divine wrath and give us peace with God. Oh, the cross. I wonder, have you ever been to the cross? Have you ever come to the place where you have looked to Calvary and realized for my sins, Calvary covers it all my sin, well, it's guilt and despair. My grief and despair, Jesus took on him there. And Calvary covers it all. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous beauty for me. I wonder, does it have the same for you? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If not, then tonight is the night that you need to come to Christ and get to the cross where God will save your soul. Stephen, thank you very much indeed, and uh, good to see your wife with you as well. Uh, we were with you in Six Mile Cross. He was ministering down at the mission, so he gets around, and he uses his gifts and talents for the Lord. We're going to ask our clerk of session to come. He's just a few announcements to make, and then we'll have just a couple of verses of a hymn, and then straight into our brother Drew giving his testimony. Thank you. Well, can I add my words of welcome to all of you who've been able to gather out uh, tonight. It's encouraging to see so many uh, out in the house of God, and we do pray that the Lord will meet with us and bless us in his presence tonight. I'll just very quickly run uh, through the announcements. Uh, over the summer months, they're not just uh, as long, usually. Uh, just two meetings during the week here in the church. That's our prayer meeting and time of Bible study. Uh, on Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. And then on Friday evening at 10 p.m., uh, there is the men's prayer meeting, so do keep those in mind, please. Also, on Friday evening, do remember that over in our neighboring congregation in Ballygon, uh, the Reverend Timothy Ormerod uh, will be installed there uh, as the minister this coming Friday evening. That uh, meeting is at 8 p.m. on Friday over in Ballygon. Do keep it in mind, please. Next Lord's Day, our service is at usual times, uh, half past 11 in the morning, 7 p.m., and of course each service preceded uh, by a half hour of prayer. And next Lord's Day, uh, the Reverend Trevor Baxter, one of our retired ministers, uh, will be with us uh, for both services, God willing. Then can I just mention briefly uh, that uh, two weeks from this evening, uh, Sunday the 9th of July, uh, we will be uh, welcoming the Cumber District LOL uh, for uh, their annual church service. Uh, that service will take place here just a bit earlier, 6.30 6 on Sunday the 9th of July, and we will be uh, joined by uh, the uh, Orange Brethren on that evening. Thank you. We thank our brother very much indeed for making those announcements, subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Just one announcement that I'll add to it, it's outside our own congregation, but this Wednesday, God willing, the 28th of June, 
Uh, over in our Balamoni Free Presbyterian Church, there will be the wedding of our brother Peter Craig to Lucy Buick, and we would ask, please, that you would remember uh, that uh, wedding in prayers. We were joking yesterday about marriage at the table. When men get together, they have a few laughs and jokes, but obviously the wives are not within earshot. That's, they could hear us laughing but they didn't know what we were laughing at. Where's James King? He, he was the one that was laughing heartily. So Ruth, you can take that in mind. But we were just saying, I said, you know, I didn't know what happiness was until I got married and then it was too late. But we're only joking, by the way. Peter will be a happy man. My boys might say to me someday, well, Thomas, or well, Dad, how much does it take to get married? I says, or no, I forgot the, what the joke was going to say there. Uh, how much does it take to get married, or what does it cost to get married? He says, I don't know, son, because I'm still paying for it. But we don't want Peter and Lucy to have a miserable start, as we suggest. But marriage is bliss. It's, it's the best thing that man can ever find, for it tells us if he finds a wife, he finds a good thing. So we trust the Lord will bless uh, Peter and Lucy. It's at 12 noon, and if you could remember that service in prayer, please. I know the family, both the Craig and the Buick family, family circles would deeply appreciate your prayers for that uh, occasion. It's at 12 noon in our Balamoni Free Presbyterian Church. If you're free, you're able to go up to that. You can view that uh, wedding, and uh, we know that the Lord will certainly be with us. Just a few verses of a hymn, 316, I think it is, 316. We'll sing the first two verses only of this hymn, and then we're going to ask our brother Drew straight away, uh, once we finish the hymn, to come to the pulpit, and he's going to share with us a personal word of testimony. 316, verses 1 and 2. door so I can make a beeline. Well, it is an honor to give a word of testimony. It's hard to believe that it was two months ago that Mr. Martin made a beeline for me across the car park after the morning prayer meeting uh, and got that grip of the Chinese burn. Um, give, make me give a word of testimony. I'm only joking about the Chinese burn. But I'd only give my word of testimony to um, the Youth Fellowship on the Friday, and two months does not take long to come around. So it is good to be here and give that word of testimony. I also had a burden on my heart to give a word of testimony, so I did, because Richard Allen, who's the same age as myself, gave a word of testimony last year. And I just thought, you know, it's time maybe I give a word of testimony. So it is. If we could just commit the Lord um, in prayer, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee tonight, O Lord, to promote thy name, to pray, O Lord, that thy would, O Lord, help me to give thee the glory that I would help me, O Lord, not to promote the things of the world, but to give thee the glory and what thou didst do for me when thou saved me. Pray, O Lord, for one that's here tonight that knows thee not, 
that they will come unto thee, as I did, and as many did here. For the backslider, O Lord, that thou would revive them, rekindle their love for thee. And for those that is walking with thee, O Lord, may they continue to walk in thy blessing and thy name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I've already been introduced, my name is Drew Murray. I was born in the Ulster Hospital in uh, August 1970. Uh, I was brought up in Cumber until my wife and I recently moved out to Clinchy approximately 18 years ago. So no doubt many of you will know me personally, know my family, especially as I have numerous cousins who attend this church here. Um, we didn't realize there were so many when we started to come here, but I do have a large family on my father's side uh, and none on my mother's side, um, which is great to see her out this evening. I'm truly thankful that I can stand here before you uh, and give a word of testimony. I'm not here to tell you of how I enjoyed the world, of how I've um, done the things in the world or promote the things of the world that I pursued, but I'm here to let you know what the Lord done for me, a simple, savior, or simple sinner saved by grace through a simple prayer due to the conviction that was laid upon my heart. If I could just ask you to turn to uh, Samuel chapter 3, verse 22 to verse 27, and then verse 33. And it says in the word of God, And behold, the servant of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought into a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the host that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he hath sent him away, and he is gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it thou, thou hast let him, sent him away, and he is quite gone? Thou knowest Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, and to know thy going out and thy coming in, and to know all that thou hast done. And when Joab was come out of, from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sarah, but David knew it not. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the gate to speak with him quietly, and smote him there under the fifth rib, and that he died for the blood of Ashahel, his brother. And verse 33. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth. I was not born into a Christian family or taught the th things of God. I could not even recollect even seeing a Bible or any book of scripture. So I didn't have the privilege to hear what many of you are hearing here this evening or at an early age. I didn't get the opportunity to hear about what Christ done for me until my late 20s, which I will touch on a bit later. However, now that I am a converted sinner, saved by grace, my wife and I endeavor to teach our, our children the ways of the Lord. So a bit of my background, as I said, I was not brought up in a Christian home, so we didn't go to church. When I mean we, I mean my mother, my father, and my elder brother. When I was around nine years of age, my mother and father split up and got divorced. Due to the split, my mother, my brother, and I just moved to a wee bungalow outside of Cumber on the Ballygown Road, where my mother had to work three jobs just to keep a roof over our head. She even had to, uh, it was even to keep a roof over our outside toilet, so that is showing what age I am. We didn't see our father much in our early years, so our mother struggled to bring us up. She attempted to send us to the Robins, the Boys Brigade, even the Sunday School, at First Cumber Presbyterian Church. But I had no interest whatsoever. And if it wasn't for the treats at the end of the lessons or the meetings, I most definitely would never have went. I cannot even recall or remember when I actually stopped attending that church or how many times I set foot through the door. But what I do remember is, I never heard anything about my sins or my need of a saviour when I was there. As I grew older and went from Andrews Memorial School into Cumber High School, I started to get into trouble. I was fighting, going around to different clubs and pubs and stealing money out of the slot machines. I was skipping school, amongst other things. 
And at this time, it ended up, um, at, at, as times went by, it ended up that the police where they're bringing me home are knocking on the door with something to relay back to my mother about what I was up to. And if I continued to do it, there would have been consequences. This broke my mother's heart. She was under so much pressure to keep us both supported and doing her best to bring us up. But I disregarded all that and continued to do the things I now regret. Do you know that a mother's love is beyond measure and they would do anything to protect their child or their children? But more importantly, do you know there's one whose love is so fast and unmeasurable that he went to the cross and died for sinners just like you and I? And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. I left school with little um, qualifications, but that didn't bother me. I had no interest. All I wanted to be was a grease monkey. And to anybody that doesn't know that, that's a mechanic. Um, and things progressed. Um, as things progressed, I also wanted to be a lorry driver, but you needed to be 21 to go through the test. I, I, I applied to be a mechanic through the government training scheme. I was successful in meeting the criteria. I trained to be a heavy mechanic. I passed my HGV test when I became 21. I drove lorries, albeit not too far, to and from the MOT centres mostly, where funnily enough, I now work and have been for over 20 years. It doesn't mean you're getting any deals apart from this man here who texts me when he's looking something. <laughs> However, through those years of being a mechanic and meeting new friends along the way, um, as well as my old school friends, I started to frequent clubs, raves, discos, parties. I started to then taste alcohol. I had no interest in it at all. I did not like it. It was disgusting for me. However, I started to experiment with drugs. This developed into testing different drugs one night a week, and then on to several nights a week, and then it escalated into Fridays through to Sundays and the Mondays before I went to work. When a Friday came, and as work was finished, that was me for the weekend. I just couldn't wait to get to the clubs. Take drugs, stay out all weekend, sleep wherever, I laid my head, but with the buzz of the drugs, you rarely did sleep. So I was never at home. As I said earlier, about getting into trouble with the police, this was worse, and it nearly gave my mother a complete breakdown, as she had no idea where I was, what I was doing, and if someone was going to call at the door with that awful bit of news, but it didn't matter to me. I was away enjoying the things of the world. Even though I was uh, into the things of the world I'm truly ashamed of now, I believe the Lord has laid it on my heart to give you an insight to who I was, what I was, and what I was doing before I got saved. On top of attending the clubs, the raves, and the doing the drugs, I was a complete petrol head. I, whatever money I had, whatever I had left over, went into my cars and into my motorbike. But my motorbike career uh, was very short. I had a fatal accident where I near lost my right leg through a compound fracture. So I never set a leg over a motorbike again after that because I was off work for a year recovering. I was involved in street racing, illegal events around the country, and especially the Cumber area. We intimidated the residents and other car users. I've been caught in police cameras, I've been on TV programs, I've been in car magazines, and so on. However, I don't want to elaborate on those, um, because there is some of those here know already what they were involved. However, my biggest passion, and still is, is cycling, especially mountain biking. To be exact, it used to be downhill mountain biking, but I can reassure you the trees are 90% in the air and they do not move when you hit them. And I have plenty of broken bones to prove that. And there, I have witnesses in here that can prove it as well. I started racing mountain biking, winning races across the province, traveling to France on many occasions. However, through mountain biking, I met many different friends. And some of those friends had no interest in clubs. They had no interest in partying, they had no interest in going and drinking, doing drugs, they had no interest in any of that. They just wanted to travel around the forest, they just wanted to go out and have fun on their mountain bikes. Through time I became very friendly with these people, and that friendship has continued for approximately 30 years, to which I am truly grateful. And I must point out that not all of these friends are Christians. However, I do pray for them on occasion, especially for Jim Flynn and there's a person sitting in front of me, I'll know him very well as well. This guy has been a very good friend for years, and I believe he needs our prayers 
So please remember this person in your prayers as he's been given gospel literature. I've spoke to him on numerous occasions. He's asked questions. And I believe there's a seed planted somewhere in his heart. And it just needs that wee bit to grow. More importantly, there was friends I made in the mountain bike community that stood out. They always were different. They always just had something about them. And now I know why. Jesus. Jesus in their hearts. I believe this is how the Lord started to work on my heart. I believe that this is how the conviction started to stir my soul. This started me thinking more about my life, what direction and path I was taking. If I continued with the drugs, where would it lead me? Where would I end up? I truly believe that God's plan for my life started when he sent one of these young Christians who was a mountain biker to start an apprenticeship in our workshop as a mechanic. And this was once again God working in my heart. It made me think about things in a different perspective. I was starting to see things in a whole new light. As these people were happy, they had no interest in the things of the world or doing the things that I was doing. And people respected them for that, their colleagues, their friends. And they had sincerity in the way they lived. It also meant that I was starting to lose interest in going to clubs, partaking in drugs. And I was starting to focus more on my cars and my mountain biking. And this was taking up my weekends, my weeknights. And as time passed by, I had no interest. And I eventually just drifted away from the drug scene. My focus was on something else that gave me a buzz, but in a different way, as it was whizzing through forests at speed that gave me the new adrenaline rush. Through meeting various people in the car mountain biking scene, I met a young Christian girl. We connected right away. We became very friendly. And then things progressed to a relationship. And through that relationship, she started asking me to attend church. My words were not a mission. There is no way I am setting foot in a door and going to a church. I had no interest in doing anything to do with the church or attending any hall or building or listening to anything from a Bible or whatever book they taught, they, they spoke from. It was my self-righteousness that was keeping me from turning away from the things of the world. However, I could see this was making her sad. It was hurting and it was having an impact on our relationship. So after several months to a year, I attended one of her evening services at the Donald Gospel Hall. And I was, it was completely alien to me. I felt so out of place. However, after numerous meetings, uh, I started to hear more about heaven and hell. But I didn't truly believe that I needed to be saved. Well, not yet anyway. I was still enjoying too much of the world and what I believed back then it had to offer. This didn't go down well with the girl. As she explained to me that she could not be unevenly yoked and it was against the will of the Lord that through prayer and the reading of the word of God that she had to break up and focus on her Christian life. If I'm being totally honest, it was devastating to hear. However, we remain friends and we still are to this day. I remember asking questions to my Christian friends. I even attempted to pray myself and ask questions for myself to see what answers would come around or even if it would be uh, enough for God to display some sort of sign in my life. And I truly believe he did have a plan, a much bigger plan. And that was for me to become friendlier with these Christian people, build a bond with them, even start to attend their church and their gospel services. I went to their church in Ballygown, as, some of the, uh, as well as some of the other free Presbyterian churches around the province. And even though I was, sa- or I was not saved, and a few years older than most, they made me feel so welcome. Their openness of their faith in Christ was was and still is evident. Mm -hmm. After attending numerous meetings, youth rallies, various services, I started to actually think, what must I do to be saved? How can I get saved when I have done the things that I have done and that I am ashamed of? And throughout this period, I started to pray more. I started to ask the Lord questions, and on the 14th of November, 1999, the Lord answered that simple but sincere prayer that saved my soul. Let me tell you how. As usual, the Ballygown folk were late to the youth rallies, and on this occasion, it was no different. We raced, and I mean 
we sort of raised to Bambridge Youth Rally. And due to us being so late, we had to embarrassingly walk up to the very front and sit in the very front row. Now, apologies that I can't remember the minister's name, but that piece of scripture I read earlier on is what the minister preached on. It was about Abner dying a fool's death because he didn't take that step of safety and refuge through the gates into the city of Hebron. And if he did, Joab would not have been able to smote him under the fifth rib and kill him in revenge of his brother. Oh boy, was my heart starting to pound. The palms of my hands were sweaty. I was shaken, my heart was going ten to a dozen because I believed and truly believed that it was just me and God in that meeting. There was nobody else. I was just being spoke to. And this was him giving me that final chance to take that step of refuge into the kingdom of God. And if I didn't repent of my sins that night, I was going to die a fool, as Abner died a fool. The conviction laid upon my heart that night was unbearable. I, couldn't, I, I, I never felt anything like it. When the service was over, I physically couldn't move. I was trembling and asking my friends, could I speak to someone? As I believe, I must seek the Lord and ask for forgiveness of my sins. So with their help and guidance, I was led into a small room uh, at the side of the church where I sat with a person named Kyrie Salt. He chatted briefly, he read from God's word. And from what I can remember, he said something like this to me. If you feel you need the Lord, and you want to be saved, then just pray unto him for repentance and ask him into your heart. So I prayed a simple but sincere prayer. It was a short prayer, and it went something like this. I am here before thee now to repent of my sins and ask you into my heart. Amen. I didn't know if that was enough. I didn't know if I'd asked the right question. I didn't know what was going to happen next. But our God is a merciful God. Amen. And he will answer sincere prayers with an answer. Oh, my word. When I stood up, I was still shaking. But I was shaking of excitement, joy, glorification unto the Lord. For a burden had been lifted. And I knew that all my sins of the past were washed away. Amen. What happened next on the way home is something that you wouldn't get away with now. I threw every CD, everything that was for the world outside my window driving down the road from Bambridge home. Additionally, there was a hymn, uh, because, sorry, I threw it all out because there was a new song in my heart. Additionally, there was a hymn that always reminds me of how close I was to missing out on that glorious call of salvation, and it is called Over the Deadline. And in particular, verse 3 and the chorus stands out, and it says this, O sinner, the Spirit is striving with thee. What if he should strive nevermore? But leave thee alone in the darkness to dwell in sight of, thy, of the heavenly shore. And the Course says, O turn while the Saviour and mercy is waiting and steer for the harbour light. For how do you know but your soul may be drifting over the deadline tonight? What a beautiful vo verse and chorus. And if you're outside Christ tonight, think in those words. For how do you know but your soul may be drifting over the deadline tonight? Come to him now, just as I did with that simple prayer of repentance. The day after my conversion, I was so excited to let people know. My first port of call was to my mother, then on to my father. However, when I told my brother and his wife, they had no interest. They admitted to be an atheist and that none of this was one of the, what I was telling them mattered. And it was only a phase that I was going through. Well, thank the Lord it wasn't a phase. Amen. And I still have that saving grace in my heart today. Amen. And the Lord has truly stuck closer to me than a brother. Even though I had good friends in Ballygown, I started to attend Cumber Baptist. There I got involved with the children's meeting, helped with whatever I could. But I stayed very friendly with all my other friends. And through those friends, I met another girl. And as they say, the rest is history. There's a short verse and it says, uh, as a short verse, and it's from Luke chapter 1, verse 37. And it says, For God, nothing, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. 
That is such a blessed verse and that I always reflect on. Avril and I went on, <coughs> Avril and I went on to promote that verse as our theme at our wedding day, and to this day it still gives me encouragement. Needless to say, when we did get married, Avril gently persuaded me uh, to join Ballygown, where we'd done the Ballygown Free Presbyterian Church, where we'd done what we could whilst bringing up um, three young children to help in the church. As a family, we went through um, and continue to go through many a trial and tribulation. However, none like the loss of Avril's. <coughs> of Avril's younger sister, Jill, at 33. Whilst I appreciate this has been mentioned before um, with our sister Deborah Huddleston giving her testimony, it impacted us in such a way. Sorry. That it completely broke my wife's heart. She's been left without that little sister. She can no longer turn to, do the things that sisters do, and have that loving bond in Christ. However, through Jill's illness, she continued to display, displayed a strong testimony to the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in her heart. And she showed, displayed no fear with facing death, as she knew she was going to that place which is far better. But that didn't detract the feelings that all those around her felt, because we believed she was too young to be taken out of this world, leaving a young family and husband behind. However, what we do know is we will see her again when we meet her in glory. Some of you know we recently joined Cumber and we thoroughly enjoy the fellowship here. Um, the church family is what is make, we believe makes this church so welcoming. Since joining here, I've enjoyed helping with the distribution of the literature around the areas as I'm not one for standing in front of a, a congregation as you've probably gathered. I only added this wee bit on after our Tuesday night of reflection of the gospel, on the gospel mission, and it has been the collaboration and working partnership of all those in this church to execute a very prosperous and fruitful mission. Through the mission campaign, I truly believe that God has brought the church closer together and introduced me and my family to new friends in Christ. But most importantly, through the preaching of the word, word it brought new souls into the Church of Christ. And there are now new names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Another wee thought of my testimony, and you've probably never heard something like this before, the testimony, but there's a lot of people in this church um, have them. They're becoming more and more popular, and it is personalized number blades. You're probably thinking, what? These are on the increase, and many search high and low to get these uh, special one, one that has their names, their initials, or just something that makes their vehicle stand out. Well, for our first Christmas as a married couple, I wanted to buy Avril her own number plate. I searched high and low, couldn't find the one that I wanted. I contacted the DVLA, told them what I wanted. They agreed it could be done. So cheekily, I asked, could I have one with my name? So we've had our number plates now for 19 years. Our number plates aren't reflective of our name. Our number plates are reflective of what the J33 stands for. When people ask us what does J33 mean, it's not J33, it is J33. J33 is a very popular piece of scripture in the Bible, and it's from the book of John. Chapter 3, verse 3. And it, says in the, and it says in God's word, verily, verily. And when we read verily, verily in the Bible, it means what is about to follow is very important and we need to listen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Since getting these number plates, it allows my wife and I to start conversations when people ask us, what does it mean? It allows us to direct and lead people um, to scripture. It allows us to witness and testify of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm saying to you tonight is, if you see these number plates about, now this one here does a bit more speeding than I do. 
especially between uh, Clinchy and uh, Downpatrick. Were the other two ladies about here speed as well, but I'm not mentioning their names. Um, if you do see these number plates about, why don't you use it as a conversation starter? Why don't you just say, do you know what that means? Do you know um, what J33 means in those plates? Not that it says Drew or Avi, but it leads to a verse of scripture. And that could help you or help someone um, promote the things of Christ and even plant that seed. Finally, in closing, I would like to say a, wee, uh, a poem that I found uh, when the build up to my testimony for um, the Youth Fellowship. For some reason, it just kept popping up in my newsfeed and Facebook and other places. And, it's, uh, and it says this, my commandment to you is this, you love one another just if I have loved you. And if that doesn't grab you, maybe this one will. Your name may not appear down here in this world's hall of fame. In fact, you may be so unknown that no one knows your name. The Oscars and the praise men may never come your way, but don't forget God has rewards that he'll hand out someday. This crowd on earth will soon forget when you are not at the top. They will, they will cheer like mad until you fall and then their praises will stop. Not God, he never does forget. And in, this, and in his hall of fame, by just believing his son forever, there's your name. I tell you, friend, I wouldn't trade my name however small. It's written there beyond the stars in the celestial hall. For all the famous names on earth, or the glory that they share, I'd rather be an unknown here and have my name up there. Thanks for listening, and may the Lord bless this testimony to your heart. And if you are here tonight and you're not saved, do not let your soul drift over a deadline tonight. Thank you. Well, could I just say a personal word of thanks to our brother Drew for sharing with us that personal word of testimony. And uh, it is an unusual passage that our brother came to know Christ through. Uh, you wouldn't imagine at a young person's rally there, and that Bambridge rally, by the way, there were literally hundreds would have attended that rally. And if you didn't get there early, you never got a seat. And they sat on the stairs and the balcony, everywhere there was hundreds of young people attended those youth rallies. And many of them were saved during those seasons of uh, youth meetings. It was an unusual text that was preached that night uh, in 2 Samuel 3. He mentioned about Abner and the word saying, died Abner as a fool dieth. And David the king wept over the death of Abner. And he says Abner was a military general. He probably was one of the greatest generals the biblical history ever records was Abner. He was an enemy of David who came over to David's side during the death of Saul and the rise of Ishbosheth to the throne. But to cut a long story short, the remarkable thing was about Abner was this, that David lamented on a number of occasions and wept publicly. And he said, died Abner as a fool death. He says, thy hands were not bound, thy feet were not put into fetters, and yet... As a wicked man before, falleth before his enemy, so fellest thou. He could never get over the death of Abner because he died a fool's death. The Bible tells me he was deceived by a well-known enemy. That enemy was Joab, his arch enemy. He fought with him for decades. He came over to David's side and Joab was David's general. They were to make peace, but Joab never forgot that Abner had killed his brother Asahel. And then Joab and Abishai, two brothers, they deceived him. They said, we want to talk with you privately. And they took him just outside the gate of the city of Hebron. And they slew him with a dagger under the rib. He died and he fell just outside the city walls. And David lamented, Abner, could you be so foolish to think that Joab, 
meant anything but murder in his heart. He had the art of political speaking, to say one thing with his mouth and mean something else in his heart, and he killed Abner just outside the city of Hebron. And David says, I can't believe it. You have been deceived by a well-known enemy. I suggest to you the message preached that night and its application was this, that the devil is your enemy and he deceives you. And if you died, as Drew mentioned, thinking you were good enough for heaven without new birth and salvation, you would perish in hell. You would have been deceived by a well-known enemy. We would lament your death as the death of a fool. Can I say something else? I have no doubt that this would have been touched on in that message at that youth rally. He not only was deceived by a well-known enemy, but he died within reach of safety. Did you know that Hebron was what is known as a city of refuge? No one could be killed if you made your way to the city. No matter what you had done by way of self-defense or accidental death, you could never be killed inside the city of refuge. But you know what Joab did? He said to Admir, I just want you to step outside the city. Just one single step outside the city walls. And then he lost the sanctity of the city. And Joab killed him knowing that he had killed him within reach of safety. If Abner had only insisted on staying within the walls of the city and not going out, he would have lived. And he wondered, David lamented his death. He's a fool to step outside and die within reach of safety. And you would die the death of a fool. And we mean this and we don't mean to offend you. You would die the death of a fool if you died within reach of salvation. And the word is nigh thee tonight, in thy mouth and in thine heart. If thou shalt believe with thine heart on the Lord Jesus Christ and confess with thy mouth, you'll be saved. You're so close. You're so near. You only have to call and he'll save you. You'll only have to come and he'll forgive you. You only have to cry. You're within reach of safety. The place called Calvary that Stephen sung about. And if you'll only take the step and get into the city of refuge, Christ, you'll be safe from death and hell. But you know something, friends, as I close, Abner was responsible for his own death. You know what David said? Thy hands were not bound. Thy feet were not put into fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. In other words, Abner, they didn't drag you to your death. You weren't forced outside the city. You made the choice yourself. And you are responsible for all eternity for the loss of your immortal soul. And friends, listen to me. You cannot blame Christians tonight. You cannot say, well, I'm not a Christian because I know people and they're hypocrites. You can't say it. You can't say, well, I know there are people and they're not living right and they profess to be Christians. And I have seen the way they behave. And I've heard what they said. Christians are not your savior. They are not your salvation. And you cannot use any excuse. If you die in your sin tonight and you perish in hell, you're responsible for your own soul. And you need to step in to Christ tonight. You need to do what Drew did. And that is, recognize you're a sinner. Will you do that? And will you believe that you cannot save yourself? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Christ died for your sins? That he suffered, bled, and rose again from the dead for you? Do you believe that if you come now to him and repent as Drew did, he will save you? Yes, save you. Yes, save you. Whatever your sins are, he'll forgive them. He's paid for them. He has suffered for them. And he calls you now and you're responsible. You will have to make a decision tonight. What will you do with Christ? Neutral you cannot be. For someday you will be asking, what will Christ do with me?
So you're responsible. You must come. How about my husband saved, but you must come. How about my dad saved, and my mother saved, and my brother and sisters are saved, my wife saved, but you must come. You must come to Christ tonight, and you must repent and believe. And if you don't, you'll die within reach of safety, deceived by a well-known enemy, the devil, and you will be responsible. You cannot blame Drew Murray. You cannot blame Cumber Free Church, and you cannot blame any other person. It's you that has to make that decision. Now, don't be a fool. Come to Christ. Receive him. And if you say, preacher, I, I don't know how to be saved, but I would like to be. Well, listen to me. There's supper for everyone tonight. We mean that. There's supper for every single man, woman, young person, boy or girl. I want to tell you, we'll be here to midnight if necessary. And we will take time with you to open up the Bible, the Word of God, and show you from Scripture how you can be saved and be sure of heaven if you die. Just make sure that you're right with God. And I mean this. Don't you worry about supper. We'll get you a cup of tea after. What you need is the Savior. Come to Christ. Speak to us tonight. And if you're concerned, you can speak to Drew or some other person you know. But don't go away without Christ. The ladies are way over now to the hall. We have given them time to get the boilers warmed up again. Uh, the food will be served. Please go over to the church hall. I will say this to you. Uh, there are no tables. Maybe there's maybe a table reserved for Drew and the family. That's all. But you sit wherever you like. Listen to me now when I'm saying this. As a minister of this church, I'll take full responsibility for my comments. There are no cliques in the church. Now, we don't want that. So when it comes to supper, sit where you like. And if you're told to get up and leave, come and see me. I'll pray for you. No, I'll not. I'll go and sort that matter out. Right. Okay. But enjoy your supper as well. Could we just sing verse 3 of that hymn then? I think, Drew, you would appreciate that. If we just sung verse 3 of that hymn, it's 233, Vivian, if that was okay. I think we've lost our organist, have we? There's a way to do the supper. Well, at least we've got our pianist, although we could have sung without music if we needed to. 232. Two, two, three, two. And we'll sing just the, first, the third verse and the chorus. We'll stand together, please, as we sing. <coughs> not yet, Bob, well, not yet. All right, we'll stand now. <laughs> stand for prayer. Father in heaven, we think of these words, what if the Spirit would strive nevermore and leave thy sad soul, Lord, even in sight of that shore, in sight of that heavenly shore. We know that thy Spirit will not always strive with men and women. We realize that. There will not, be, not always be a time when sinners can be saved. They are to be saved now. Lord, we believe that scriptural. They are to be saved tonight, not tomorrow. And we pray, Lord, you will give concern, just as Drew came into meetings with no thought of his soul, and yet you awakened and you arrested him, and you converted and saved him, and he has no regrets. Lord, hear prayer tonight. Save lost souls, we beseech thee. Little children, young people, young adults, seniors, God, grant that you'll sift and search the congregation. And grant, Lord, you'll call sinners to repentance and faith in Christ. Restore backsliders to first love again. 
revive the church and glorify thy dear son. Take of our thanks now for the meetings of today. We thank thee too for the supper that's been provided. And as many uh, wait on and sit together around the table, may we do so with a thankful heart, with a grateful soul, and do bless our fellowship together and receive of our thanks for these good things. Part us afterward in thy fear and favor. Watch over us as we take our journey home. Remember the activities of the house this incoming week. And grant, Lord, on Wednesday at the wedding, it'll please thee to presence thyself with Peter and Lucy, the installation on Friday night in the divine will. And grant, O God, that we will know the presence of God and the help of the Lord. We offer this our prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' precious name. And the people of God said, Amen. Make your way across to the church hall. Thank you.